morning. Um, Jeannie, can you hear me okay? Audible, clear? All right. <laughs> After the prayer, um, I was all excited. I was ready to come in. But Elder Derek just told me, Brother Mike, after the, after the song, <laughs> hold your horses. <laughs> anyway, glad to be here and glory to God. First of all, um, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the opportunity. At last, finally, um, you're all not that small. <laughs> um, finally, I'm here um, in front of you, seeing all of you in person. Uh, most of you I've seen over the Zoom. And uh, I'm also happy to see Brother Lito uh, here, uh, whose brother I've known in the Philippines, a great man of faith. He's a lawyer, actually. And he's a school director, Bible school um, director. So, again, I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity. And I want to thank everybody. I want to thank um, the elders, the elders, Brother Charles, um, Brother Derek, Brother VR. I know he, he is watching via Zoom, Brother VR, um, Brother Carl. Calvin and Brother Rex over there. So I want to thank everybody for bringing me over and seeing uh, something in me. So I want to thank all of you. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Again, good morning. Are you excited? Are you excited? Yeah, I know I am. I'm excited to be here, to be with all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, glory to God. Now, are you excited every Sunday? Uh, are you excited? Really? Come on. Are you excited every Sunday? Every Sunday to wake up, you know, to wake up and worship the Lord. If you're not excited, then something's wrong. <laughs> something's wrong with me if I'm not excited every Sunday to get up, right? So, are you excited every time you congregate? Are you excited every time you have fellowship with your fellow Christians, with your fellow saved ones? Are you excited? Are you excited? All right. So, are you excited to meet God? Who amongst you are excited to meet God? Raise your hands. All right. Who wants to go first? All of a sudden, all the hands are. Probably you, brother, might you go first. <laughs> but, you know, but are you really excited to talk about God? Are you really excited about God? Now, let me just tell you a bit. During the process of my petition, I was looking at my email every day, which I don't normally do, right? I don't normally do it. Um, during the process of that petition, I check my email two or three times a day. And all I'm excited to see was the name of Brother Charles, Brother Charles Williamson. That is all that I am excited to see. You know why? Well, it's because I know that under that name, inside that mail, is a good news. <laughs> it's a good news from God. And... Uh, I'm looking for that name because I know under that email is the good news from God, which is the approval of the petition. Then one day, around 2 a.m., my time, um, someone, <laughs> someone um, messaged me, and she said, and, I was, and I'm looking at her right now, and she said, Brother Mike, check your email email which i just checked a few minutes ago and there was nothing in the email nothing new in my mail and she said you know just check it right now and um, i checked my email 
and I was both nervous and excited at the same time. And lo and behold, the name of Brother Charles Williamson is in my, is in my email. And uh, when I opened that email of Brother Charles, I got goosebumps everywhere. You know, I think even my nostrils got goosebumps. I don't know if that's good or not. <laughs> but anyway, of course, my first reaction was to thank God. To thank God. You know, I was, I was crying at that time, to be honest. I'm an, I'm an emotional guy. Um, in my jubilation and in my excitement, I wanted to shout like, yes, like that, you know. But it's 2 a.m. in the morning. It's 2 a.m. And my daughter and my wife were all sleeping at that, that day, you know, at that time. So I was like, yes, you know. And then I went to my wife and then sil silently touch her and wake her up. And I told her, I got approved. And I, Shh. you know, I don't want her to get excited as well and wake our daughter, you know. And she was, she was very, uh, very happy and excited. And now I'm here excited to serve the Lord and to learn from all of you. I know I will learn a lot from all of you. Now, talking about excitement, chances are, if you have something that excites you, what do you do? You want to share it, right? You want to share it with so many people as possible as you could, as possible as you can. But if something that does not excite you, chances are, you know, you are not interested to share it. You know, just keep it to yourself. But if something that excites you, you won't keep your mouth shut. You want to tell everybody about it. If something excites you, you want to talk to someone about it. You know, if Jesus excites you, you want to talk to Jesus to your friend, right? Now, what if I told you, I'll make you prosperous? Would that excite you? What if I tell you right now, I'll make you rich? Does that excite you or no? Probably you're rich already. <laughs> but will that excite you? If someone that is poor, if I tell that person, I'll make you rich, he'll be excited. He'll be excited, you know. Now, many are excited to be rich. Where, where I came from, many are excited to be rich. Many are excited to get rich, you know. If you invite people in a business opportunity meeting with free lunch and all, with free giveaways, chances are you'll, you'll jump back the hall. But if you invite them, if you invite them for a Bible study or a church service, this is what you're gonna get, right? Now, they don't have time. I was talking to Brother Kennedy Yesterday, later, it's never. If you invite someone, if he told you, well, maybe, that maybe translates to never, somehow. All right? Now, if you ask the people, if you invite them for a business opportunity meeting, you tell them, I want it, uh, I, I'll get you rich. And then if you ask the people, no, raise your hands if you want to get rich. People would raise their hands. And they, and they will even shout, woo! Right? I want to get rich. Then if you tell them, I'll make you rich, then let's talk about Jesus. All of a sudden, their hands will go down. And they will tell the person beside, beside them, I thought we're here to get rich and not to be preached upon, right? So, now having said all those things, we will talk about being excited about God. And that will be our topic for today. Excited about God. Now, 
if the things that we're going to talk to you today won't excite you or those that are or those that will watch this or watching right now won't excite them then i don't know what is now did you know that god has a plan for you do you know that do you know that god has a plan for you now prophet jeremiah in our scripture reading particularly in chapter 29 verse 11 revealed this to us for i know the plans i have for you now it is an assurance by god it is an assurance by god to us that he has a plan for you and i it means that god is thinking about you isn't that something the God of this world, the God who created you, is thinking about you. The God of the universe who created me is thinking about me. Not for one second are we ever forgotten by our God. Isn't that, isn't that great? How will, how will it make you feel, for example, if the president of the U.S. not only knows you, but has a plan for you, has something for you? He's thinking about you. I know that will excite you, right? If you know that the president is thinking about you and has a plan for you, you'll be excited. You'll be excited. But God has a plan for you as well. Now, David, at one point in his life, contemplate on this. What is man that you think of him? And as and a son of man that you are concerned about him. Now, in comparison with the grandeur and the majestic of heavens, David seems that it is wholly unworthy of God's attention. We are wholly unworthy of God's attention. But no, God has a plan for you. You are worthy of God's attention. He was thinking, why will the all-powerful think about me? a mere human being why would he think about you but god has a plan for you and why will god has have plans for us why will god think of me now think with me for a while on this i have three wonderful kids i made them well of course together with my wife my eldest mitchell in his 20s Marcus and ella in in their teens so pretty much grown up now over the years, they may have offended us. Now, even your sons and daughters, over the years, they, they may have offended you. But that doesn't stop us from loving them, right? That doesn't stop us from thinking about them. That doesn't stop us from making wonderful plans for them. Why? Because they are our own flesh and blood. They came from us, right? So we were responsible somehow for their existence. Now, going a bit further to say we created them. Well, of course, we know that God created all of us. And this is not to take away credit from God. Now, the Bible says that God made us in his own image, in his own likeness. If we humans, as parents like you and I, to our children, have that soft spot in our hearts to forgive and love our children, even if they disobeyed us, how much more God is to us, right? So therefore, I find it too difficult to imagine that God will not think of me. I find it difficult to imagine that God will not make plans for all of us. And we are, as the Bible called us, calls us, we are the, uh, the masterpiece of God. Now, here you go. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says we are God's masterpiece. We are God's ultimate creation. Even though we may have disobeyed him, God loved us. God is thinking about you. Don't ever forget that. Even if you fall down many times, God is thinking about you. He wants you to get up. God is there right beside you. Okay. Now, isn't that something? Isn't that something that God?
thinks about you every day. So if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what is. There are many people you know, who have photographic memory. They remember things, you know, dates, numbers, uh, compared to other people, just like my wife. My wife, uh, for instance, she has a, a photographic memory. She knows and are mindful of the dates, um, our siblings, uh, her friends, her moms, my mom, you know. She knows almost all the, the important dates, but I'm not. I'm not good at that. You know? And there are people who are very good at remembering. Now, get ready for this. Remembering bad things. You know, there are a lot of people who remember bad things. You know, things that you did to them that are bad. Things that you should have done to them. Uh, they don't forget. They don't forget. Even the smallest details, they don't forget. No, they don't forget. But look, Hebrews chapter 10, 17, look at our God. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. But unfortunately, my dear brothers and sisters, for us humans, we do the exact opposite, right? We do the exact opposite. We forget our friends, but we never forget the wrongdoings. Uh -huh. They'll forget you, but they won't forget what you did to them. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> you know, we, we, we harbor it in our hearts. You know, the, 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 the pain that they cause us, they harbor it, we harbor it in our hearts. We constantly remind our, ourselves of those not so good things. No wonder why we are so unhappy. No wonder why you are full of bitterness. No wonder why we are all messed up. And you ask yourself, why am I like this? Why am I all messed up? It's because you harbor bitterness in your heart. Right? Now, what are these verses? What are those Verses telling us. It tells us that God does the opposite. He knows you, but he forgets your sins. He said, I will remember them no more. God remembers you. He thinks about you. How cool is that? Now, God forgets my wrongdoings to him, but he does not forget me. Now, can you tell the one beside you? Can you tell the one beside you, God does not forget you? God do not forget you. Can you tell the person beside you? He does not forget you. He forgives you. And then finally, can you tell that person, God loves you? You know, God loves you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, that God loves you? Now, there's a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we truly have in Jesus. And I have a truly found a friend in him. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what is. It is one thing to know God that thinks of you, that he has plans for you. It is another to know what his plans are. Okay. So what is God's plan for you and I? Plans to prosper you. He plans to prosper you. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You know, the idea of prosperity, the idea of prosperity that God plans and wants us to have doesn't only focuses on financial aspect. You know, people, when they talk about prosperity, they think about financial. No. When God talks about prosperity, that when God talks about he wants to prosper you, he's not only talking about financial aspect in life he's talking about our general welfare it includes your health your safety your overall happiness knowledge wisdom peace evil or harm to befall upon us is never a part of god's plan 
His plan has always been for our good. In this plan of God for you, God has provided everything <clears throat> that you need for in this life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, that God has given everything for us? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness, to the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Now, did you get that? Did you get that? It says, God has granted us or provided us all things that pertain to life. All things. Now, we might be thinking, oh, God, for real? All things? Yeah, all things. Now, ask yourself, what is it that you need? What do you need? You need money? You need money for your basic needs, like clothes, shelter, uh, food. You need healing when you are sick, when you are wounded. You need comfort in bereavement. Strength when you are overwhelmed, courage in the face of adversity. You want peace in the midst of tribulations. You want faith. You want faith when you're despair. Even love and wisdom. You know, we need all those things. We need all those things. Not only money, not only financial, but God will provide everything that you need. All of those things that I've mentioned, God will provide it to you. But God your God and my God said all these things he will provide. Now, often people would say, if God is all you have, you have all you need. Amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What else do you need if you have God? What else do you need if you have God? Now, this saying, they say it comes from the principle in John chapter 14, verse 8. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Again, if you have God, then what else do you need? First and foremost, God gave you your life. God gave you your life. Now, this means that God is sufficient, that God is enough for you and I. Now, many people thought that God will only fill that compartment of faith or that spiritual compartment in your life. But no, God will meet all of your needs. All of your needs, he will meet. So in reality, God is all that you need and is sufficient for you. Now, Peter is clear that God granted us all things that we need for life. It is all in here. Now, look around you. If you want work, there's work. You know, I'm surprised that here in the U.S. there's a lot of work. There's a lot of opportunity. But where I came from, none. So Peter is right. If you want work, there's work everywhere. If you want food, there's food. You want peace, you have to pursue it and you'll have it. The thing is you have to go after it. You have to pursue it. You must want it. You know, you have to flex those, flex those muscles of yours, right? Now, work for it. Now, think again with me a second about, let's say, about a family. Now, about your family, all you wanted for them is to have a good life, right? Just like God. God wants us to have the best of life. Now, you go to the best school and enroll your children. You pay for their tuition fees. But if they will not go to that school, even how prestigious is that school is, they won't have that education, right? Your children must go there. Now, again, if you want them to have a good health, now you buy them the best insurance that your money can buy, right? But if your children got sick, and if they don't go to the hospital or the doctor, even if you bought them the, 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 the best insurance, the best health insurance there is, they won't get better. They won't get better. So same with God. You see, the, the money, the effort that you put in for them, for your children, will be a waste of time. 
if they won't go to that school, even how prestigious that school is, if they won't go to that uh, the doctor or to that hospital, even if you buy them the best health care, the best insurance there is. Now, God made everything available for us. Now, you as parents, you know, never meant evil nor harm to befall on your children. It's never part of your plan. Same thing with God. Evil is never part of God's plan. Same with God. You see, God made everything available to us. We just need to do our part to prosper, have a meaningful life that God planned for us from the very beginning. He never planned to hurt us. He never planned to abandon us. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4, and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, here are some of the principles. Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. Now remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Okay, now another thing that you should be excited about God is this. You know, God created us with the mind of our own, right? God has given us this free will with the ability to think, comprehend, and make decisions. Now, with these things, God knows that sooner or later, you know, many will abandon him. God knew that from the very beginning when he gave us free will. There will be time that many people would abandon him and choose the path of evil. And this is evident when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now having that in mind, having that in God's mind, now do you know, that part of God's plan for you is to give you hope in a better future. Do you know that? To give you hope in a better future. Now, you know, brothers and sisters and friends that are here today, you know, God is not shutting entirely the door for all of us. He is giving us hope despite the fact that many of us had turned our backs on him. I know I did. I know I did many times. But God is so good. God is good. He has given me that hope. He let that door open for me. And now I'm here in front of you. I'm a living testimony to that. God is so good. If that happens to you, then I'm telling you, brother, I'm telling you, sister, that God is not shutting the door for you. He's giving us that hope. Hope that someday we will go back to him. Hope that someday that most of the people that are, that are outside of this congregation, that are outside of these four corners of this room, will come back to him. Will go back to him. Just like me. What I did, I came back to God. He opened that door for all of us. And he wants us to come back to him. You see, God is still had that door open for everybody. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. When God gave you that opportunity to change, when God gave you that opportunity to come back to him, he's letting that door open that nobody can shut. But until that door is open, he's waiting for you. Don't let that door close. Because when that door closes, nobody can open that door. You know, hope means opportunity. Hope means opportunity. It means he gives opportunity to people to escape wrath. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand his slowness. But he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but to everyone to come to repentance. Now, it says there, 
the Lord. He, now going back, okay, hope, He, God gives us opportunity. You see, the Lord gives you that opportunity. What opportunity? He's patient with you. He's patient with you. That is the opportunity that God is giving all of us, that God gave me when I turned my back from Him. He gave me that opportunity that He is patient. Opportunity to all, to people. You see, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish so that we could escape wrath. And that is hope. Hope is equals opportunity. God has given us that hope, that opportunity to come back to Him so that you and I will not perish. If that does not excite you, I don't know what is. And I know I'm excited. I'm excited to be back to God, and I'm excited to share the message of God to all of you. Now, how can you not be excited about that? about God giving you hope, waiting for you to come back. Now, every morning that we wake up, I want you to remember this. Every morning that you wake up must remind you of another opportunity that God had given to us or is giving to us to rectify our mistakes, to correct our mistakes in life and go to Him through faith and be faithful to Him onwards. Now, you know another thing I will tell you about hope is the word certainty. Certainty. Remember that word, certainty. When the Bible talks about hope, it is talking about certainty. The certainty of happening. It is not just only like your daydreaming or wishful thinking. No. When God talks about certainty, it is bound and it is sure to happen. Not like in our human term, when we talk about certain, somehow it's either yes or no. It's 50-50 actually. For example, you got interview for work and you are hoping that you will get hired. Now, that hope that you have is not 100% guarantee that will get you hired. You are just praying to God, hoping that you will be hired. But it is not 100% guarantee. But when God talks about hope, when God talks about certainty, it's 100%. It is happening. And it will come. Now, not only that God is giving you an opportunity, you know, that hope, but He qualifies it. He qualifies what hope is all about. A future. Remember our slide a while ago? Hope. And he qualifies that hope. He's giving you a future. A future that is not wishful thinking. A future that is not, you know, something that, well, hoping that it will come. No. A future that will certainly come. But this future, you know, is not just any ordinary future. But the best future you and I could ever imagine. Now, I want us to look at this statement of Paul. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You see, there is glory in the future, and it will be revealed to us in the future. 1 Peter chapter 1, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable and defiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You see, you see your future? Where is your future? Here? No, in heaven. Your future is in heaven. Now, what is that living hope? That Peter is talking about. Hope that is not just, again, wishful thinking, but hope that is, you know, that is not certain, that is not uncertain, but is certain. Now, this living hope is about something that is beautiful. This living hope is something that is wonderful, 
that is something that is amazing that will certainly come because it is made by a living God. It's promised by a living God. Now look at as it says. It says there, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, God is not dead, but alive. Our brother Carlos and I were talking uh, yesterday. Uh, he was uh, telling me about uh, the, the lady, you know, the, the barber or the hairdresser. And um, he was mentioning about me, about Buddha. And she told the lady, you know, when you go to the grave of Buddha, you'll find this bone. But when you go and look for the, the bone of Jesus Christ, you won't find it. You won't find it because he's alive. Amen. He's alive. We are serving a living God. Amen to that. Now, I want you to look back at yourself. You know, I want you to look at yourself and all that you have now. Now, look at yourself. Look at what you have now. now I want everybody to dig inside their pocket. Now, dig inside your pocket. Come on. Dig inside your pocket. What do you have? Keys to the car. What else do you have? Cell phones. Money. Uh, what else? Medicine. Um, I have a candy uh, feeling here. <laughs> now, soon, all of those things will be gone. Soon, all of those, all of those things will be gone. The keys to your car, the keys to your house, the money that you have. Now, now before all those things be gone, give it to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now, now, look at me. I want everybody to look at me. I'll be looking at you. Okay, now. Look at the person next to you. Come on, look at the person next to you. Okay. Soon, we won't see each other again. Soon, we will be gone. And that is the fact. That is bound to happen. Right? Now, that living hope, that living hope gives us a new life. I want you to listen. A new life that will not end. Amen. A new life that will not end. A new life with God in heaven. Did that make you excited? I know I am. I know I am. See, notice the word cause us to be born again. See, it cause us to be born again. Now, take a look at the future. Take a look at this future that God wants you to have. He said an inheritance. An inheritance meaning future. That is what? Imperishable. You will not suffer. Undefiled. You see, undefiled. You will not get dirty anymore. And fading. You will be never lost. You will not get lost again. You'll never, I mean, you'll live forever with God. You will never fade. You see? Just amazing. Now, just briefly going through it, you see. Imperishable, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 53. Undefiled, Revelation 21, 27. It says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb, book of life. Unfading, Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Now, what makes heaven? a better future than here on earth. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what makes heaven a better future. It says there. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Do we see that? Do we get that? Did you get that? Do we see all what kind of future that God planned for us to have. If the picture of heaven does not excite you, maybe 
some people would like to go to hell. You know, can I tell you a brief story? It was 12 midnight back home, and I was, for the first time, I won a, uh, a facial sauna, steam sauna. I put uh, water and the steam will come up, will come out from that uh, facial steamer. Then I put my head, it was 12 midnight. I put my head and the steam was coming out and I was hot. When I raised my head up, I was crying. I was crying. You know why? God reminded me of hell. I was crying. I was crying. I was on my knees crying to God and asking God for forgiveness. You see, if heaven, if the picture of heaven does not excite you, I don't know what is. Now again, do you want to see God? Do you want to see God? You want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. Want to go to Amen to that. But Lord, not now. We all, we have many more souls to reach out. Amen to that. Now, brothers and sisters, you know, who can give such a plan for his people? God alone can give you that wonderful plan. Okay. What kind of God he is that is willing to wait for you, giving you hope that someday you will make that change and that he is there at the door waiting for you with arms wide open. Now, what kind of God is he that he prepared the, ble the best place for you and I to come home after a tiring journey here on earth? You see, what kind of God he is that he gave his only son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to appease himself from his own wrath, mind you, from his own wrath. He sent his only son so that you and I will not die in our sins. If these things that not excite you, my dear brothers and sisters, I don't know what is. If all of those things that we talk about does not excite you to serve God, does not excite you to come every Sunday to worship God and come to congregate every time there's an opportunity for us to congregate and worship our living God, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. Now I'm calling all of you. And I know Brother Rex is posting this in YouTube because I've watched uh, some of the sermons here via YouTube. I'm calling those who have not accepted the Lord to come forward, you know, as they say, don't be shy, <laughs> and receive the promise of God. Receive the promise of God. And uh, I was thinking of Bob Barker, um, who used to say in his game show, come on down. I want you to come on down. I want you to accept the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, I call upon you to come forward as well. Let your brothers and sisters pray for you. If you have some issues or whatever, that you want your brothers or sisters to pray for you, please reach out. Those that have any problems in their life, come forward as well. Let your requests and petitions be made known. And if there be anything, this congregation, if there's anything the brethren or I can do for you. I can wait, Brother Carlos. I cannot wait. I can wait for your call. We're talking yesterday and we're meeting of the mind. <laughs> I'm excited for that. You know, whatever that this congregation, the elders can do for you, please reach out. And again, I want to thank all of you for your time. I want to thank God for this opportunity that has given me. Um, God bless you. And uh, again, to God be the glory, a pleasant day to all of you.